You are on Saturday Magazine Joy 94.9 with Mac and Tess. Our next guest is Katie Larson. Katie is the Senior Manager Inclusion, Inclusion and Participation at Mind Australia. You Katie. know how I feel about that word inclusion, Mac, don't you? I don't know. I might, I might actually check with you, Katie. Sure. Inclusion, what does that mean? Ah, what does it mean? Well, I guess when it, when when we think about it at Mind, we're thinking about how do we ensure that people, regardless of who they are, uh, their culture, their identity, their background, their experience, um, that they feel valued and affirmed when they access our services or when they come and work with us um, and that we don't assume that that will happen for people um automatically that we take a really proactive So approach. why aren't you the manager for equity and participation? <laughs> well, I mean, I could be. Yeah, and, I, I, have an issue. I actually have an issue with this because I, I, I hear this all the time and I hear organisations constantly wanting to talk about being inclusive yep. and, and having inclusive values. And, and I think, well, I'm sick and tired of being told I can be included. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, like... Why can't I just be treated as an equal like everybody else? Well, because it doesn't work like that, does it? And we know that it doesn't. And uh, look, frankly, if I can work myself out of a job, I'll be happy. But well, uh, you, won't. you <laughs> won't. I haven't been you able to. You could change yet. your title, though. <laughs> I'll take it up with the management. But at the moment, I. Hey, management. <laughs> I think Jill Callis is your boss, That's isn't she? Right, yeah, yeah, Jill. Think, think through the language, please. <laughs> well, I think at the end of the day, it's about signalling that we are uh, that we're really active and how we think about yeah. people um, do come to our services, and that we don't assume that um, someone who is LGBTIQA plus or as of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background or any combination of other forms of difference is going to feel automatically included. Um, now, we'd like to talk about the services yes. that you do offer, but before we go on to that. Tell us about the impact that you believe that you've witnessed probably through your service. And the outcomes that, that we've seen, you know, the, what, how that's manifested itself in referrals, for example. Yeah, well, we have a, we have a LGBTIQA plus specialist service called Aftercare, which offers suicide support to LGBTIQA plus people and their families who have experienced suicidal attempt or ideation. Um, and we've seen two months' worth of referrals, I think possibly even more now, thanks to the last week, um, over the last two or three weeks following the debate about the religious discrimination bill. Um, and, you know, that puts enormous pressure on our service. I'm sure we're not the only specialist service uh, that's, that's seen that occur. And it just goes to show that um, when we have these national conversations about our rights as a community to access education or services, or just to exist, um, it has an, a flow-on impact from a mental health perspective. And that's often not what we talk about in the conversation. We talk about the bill, we talk about what it means, mm. but we don't actually think about the direct and profound impact on mental health. And that doesn't stop when the bill gets shelved. Mm. No. We now see that flow on for weeks and months. So tell us, what sort of numbers have you seen? What, what, what's what been the impact on your organisation? Well, we, we run quite a small special... So MIND is a... As a is a larger organisation that provides a range of services nationally. Our specialist aftercare service is a small service that runs out of Northcote um, through the Northwest Primary Health Network, um, and and so we've seen uh, about four times the amount of referrals. So, wow. um, over the last week, I think um, we've seen at least at least six, which is quite enormous for the size of the service. So. Um, so that's quite profound. And that has an impact on our staff. Um, uh, the aftercare team do an incredible job. Um, they're all peer LGBTIQA plus peer workers. So they're all people with who, are, who identify as queer and have a lived experience of suicidality. So they're working directly from um, a lived experience of, of exactly um, the support that they're providing and they do an incredible job. But it's, it's a huge pressure on our service. So, Katie, give us a sense of what sorts of issues are coming up. What are people talking about with you? Um, so... What tends to come up as issues around isolation, um, around discrimination, um, I don't know directly the people that have come through the service exactly what they've experienced, but we know that the, the psychological distress that, occur, that occurs when we have a national conversation um, about sex, sexuality and gender identity and, and rights is it, it um, heightens old wounds, I suppose, and it can... and, and really deeply impact people who are already feeling separate from community, um, who may be feeling really vulnerable, who may be feeling like they don't have networks they can reach out to. I mean, if we look at, look at back at the, the impact of the marriage equality yeah. vote, which obviously this flows from, um, that had a profound impact right across our community. And, and then it still you, is. And it still is yeah. because this is what we're seeing over the last, the last few weeks. 
Um, so when people are already experiencing levels of vulnerability, um, and we know that for LGBTIQA plus mental health, that's it, we know that the, the rates are staggeringly high and we also know that that's not just bad luck, that's related to experiences of mm. discrimination and marginalisation. So, so it's, it's elevated. I, I have to confess that... Um, even I, um, in the middle of the uh, religious discrimination debate a few weeks ago, began to feel, found myself feeling a bit down and I thought I had to sort of stop in my own tracks and check in with myself and say, well, what's going on here? And I, and I, and I think for me it's here we go again. The LGBTIA com- community yet again mm. is being talked about mm-hmm. by mainstream and, you know, subpopulation groups within our community were being kicked around like a football. Yeah. And yep. I found that really challenging and really offensive, to be honest. Absolutely. It, look, it is challenging and it is offensive. And for those of us, you know, I've, I've had the same experience myself. Um, I have lived experience of mental ill health. So for me, I'm always monitoring how I'm going, but I'm well supported. I've got good networks and, and I'm, I'm doing pretty well, but you still feel it. That's right. So what does that mean for people who are already having a difficult time and then we have these debates really publicly? So, uh, and particularly, I think, for our trans and gender diverse yes. community um, and I a young pl- a young trans and gender diverse yeah. community. There's I'm pleased people. that people are actually calling though. I think that that's a, a fantastic yeah. Yeah. thing in itself Absolutely. because it's so easy to just remain at home isolated, stewing away, feeling down, getting depressed and not doing something about it. So that, that's the positive side that there are services like yours that are available to do that. And, and I think the positive side of a service like this is, as, as I said before, every everyone that works there has a lived experience of suicidality and is part of the queer community. So when, you, when you're calling, when you're accessing a service, you're accessing a peer. You don't and actually it, have to explain what it feels like. No, <laughs> but you're getting a bit more than a, a friendship or, a, or your, you, you know, your group of friends might be able to provide because, they, because our, our team are trained in how to work with you from that perspective. But, yeah, there's a hell of a lot you don't have to explain. So tell us a bit about your organisation, um, what you do and how people can access services. Mm. Yeah, so we're a large community specialist um, mental health organisation. We've been operating for over 40 years. Um, we run a range of services, um, sub-acute, uh, community outreach, um, supported housing and, and independent living services. Um, we have some specialist services that we operate. So aftercare is an example of that, where we work specifically with the LGBTIQA plus community. Um, in terms of how you access our services, well, I can I can provide links if it's helpful directly to the aftercare service. So that um, if you go to mindaustralia.org.au forward slash aftercare, you can find out about that service. Um, a lot of our services, you get referrals through GPs or primary mm. health networks, um, but we also are now run, running mental health and wellbeing hubs, part of a large group of community organisations, which have been an initiative in Victoria based on the impacts of COVID. Um, so uh, they're, they're services within community where people can get support that may never have access to mental health. Um, what sort of support? Oh, all kinds. Of, basically, working with um, lowering distress, initial assessment might be referral on to other services. Um, we do have peer workers within those services too, so that that um, lived experience specialist support. So just um, providing that initial point of contact, and then and and then in some cases providing a few months of support or referring on to other services. As well. Sounds great. Yep. We saw um, last weekend at uh, Melbourne Pride the Victorian government announced. You know, a, a package of funding specifically targeted for our community uh, around the the impact of the religious discrimination bill. Mm. Um, there's never enough money. No. <laughs> <laughs> there but what sort of... Well, sorry. that's part of the issue, Mac. The other part of the issue is there's not enough workforce. Either. Not enough yeah. practitioners. So yeah. I'm, I'm hearing this uh, through mental health services all over the place yeah. that they just can't get people... They've got the money, but they just can't get people to employ. Mm. Mm. Are, you, are you finding that issue as well? There's definitely a strain on the workforce, um, and we need to invest heavily in our mental health workforce to ensure not only that we have the numbers, but we have people who are well-trained, we have quality, and we have appropriate supports and mm. training. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely seeing um, seeing that impact across the workforce as well. But we also, yeah, funding's always an issue too. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the ongoing challenge. And I think a particular challenge for LGBT. TIQA plus specialist services. So um, we run on, you know, a short contract with a service like Aftercare and and so we need to m- really look at how we have that continuity. A lot of, of the service. time is, is spent about working working out 
you know, where the next lot of funding is going to come from, you know, to give some continuity. That's right. Yeah, it can, can be, particularly for these specialist services. Mm. But when we find they're addressing such an enormous need in the community, um, I think we really need to look at how we can continue them. Do you think, I ask you to pay devil's advocate perhaps a bit here, <laughs> uh, federal elections coming up, mm. um, obviously, you know, your organisation and others, you know, we're always advocating uh, with the political parties for more support. Do you think the federal election campaign is also going to be a bit triggering for people? Ah, it's a good question. It depends what the conversation is, um, I, I, and, I, and it depends who the people are. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's always, I think, triggering for different people in different ways. What it'll look like for our community, um, don't know yet. Mm. Um, I think, um, but I think it's important to, to acknowledge, I suppose. From my perspective, when I think about it, you know, we've just had this horrible experience with this bill um, and it's only been shelved. So I think that there's oh, always that tension of what's coming be back. back. Yeah, will yeah. it come back again? Will it come back? It's what's not, it going to look it's like? It's not will it. It will. Mm. It will. If the government wins, it'll be back. If the opposition win, they've said they want to legislate in this area too. So one way or another, we're going to be having the discussion again. So I suppose it's the basis of my my question. Yeah, and I think what, what we talk about when we look at LGBTIQA plus um, mental health is that impact of minority stress and that yeah. constant vigilance. Um, so we, we talk about that within service access, always trying to assess if a service is safe. So that's why organisations like ours need to make sure we work really hard proactively to, to send messages of safety, but also in the broader discussion. Um, what will be the next discussion that comes up? And what What's minority stress? Minority stress is um, a way of understanding the impacts of um, stress that occur when you're part of a minority group that ex experiences marginalisation. So it's um, it's either the direct day-to-day -day experiences of discrimination or it's that vigilance that you carry when you're constantly assessing safety. So if for those of us within the LGBTIQA plus community, we know what that feels like. You walk into a building the way that I've walked into the Pride Centre for the first time today and there's an immediate sense of safety. When you're walking into a service, a health provider or an education environment, you're actually looking we're assessing, right? We're looking for the rainbow flag or the trans flag or the staff that look familiar or the kind of knowing smile that you have when you when you connect with community. So all of those ways of assessing safety, but that takes its toll over time when you're constantly doing that work of assessing safety, and that's true across minority groups. Uh, that's a really lovely way to explain it. Mm. I mean, people often say to me, what's the value in flying a rainbow flag? That's exactly right. Mm. That's exactly why. It's a, an indicator that this organisation has thought about it mm -hmm. and is making a statement to say we are a safe organisation. It might be about inclusion. Well, it is about inclusion, I would argue. <laughs> you know, I hate being included. <laughs> I know. But we all love being equal. And I would always, exactly. advocate, I always, always advocate equal is the best word. The notion of, in, of inclusion suggests that somebody can include you. That's and true. that's the bit that I actually object to, yeah. is that I find it paternalistic. And I think that in, in, in a modern world, we should be treated as equal partners, mm -hmm. not somebody has the power to include you. Absolutely. No, I think it's a good point. It, it, who holds that power and who's in the dominant kind of position to assess uh, who will be included and who won't be? We'll get to that. We'll get to the equal bit. But the inclusion sends a strong message about you know the work that we're doing. Mm. Katie, thank you for your for your time. You're going to have to change your email signature. <laughs> well, I'm going to describe you as being the senior manager inclusion. No, um, equity and participation. Oh, sure, there I'm happy go. with that too. There you go. <laughs> thank you, Katie. Thanks. Um, Thanks for coming into the studio. Great to meet you. Great.